welcome to True Crime Wine Wednesday. I am Sherilyn Dale and I am so glad you found me. Today we are talking about the murder of Kim Wall. I came across this uh, documentary on Netflix last week and I was horrified. Kim was a journalist who boarded a homemade submarine to do an interview with the inventor of the submarine who also planned to launch a homemade rocket ship into space. But when he resurfaced, Kim was not with him. And the events that unfolded as to why she wasn't were bone chilling. Now before we get started, if you could make sure you are subscribed and notified to the channel, it would mean more to me than you know. I have a new video for you every single Wednesday and sometimes even on a Friday. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to our sponsor today, Rocket Money. I know I've mentioned in a few videos lately, I'm really focusing on the goal in the house is reducing monthly expenses. I've feel like I got overwhelmed with like a subscription here and a streaming service here and interest interest rates just becoming so overwhelming that I can't even say interest rates right now. If you're feeling the same way, Rocket Money is a really great tool for you to help with all of that. It's an all-in-one finance platform that helps you save more and spend less. The personal finance manager allows you to manage your subscriptions, lower your bills, monitor your credit score, and build your savings all in one place. Canceling subscriptions has been one of like the biggest obsessions I've had lately. It's shocking how many I had that I paid for every month that I didn't even know about. With Rocket Money, it safely and securely identifies reoccurring charges and then cancels unwanted subscriptions for you with just a tap. I'm in Canada, so I don't have the luxury and convenience of having Rocket Money do all of that hard work for me. And I really wish I did because every single month I catch another one that just slipped through the cracks. And I get so frustrating because I'm like, ah, oh, you got me this month. Cancel. But then it always happens. Another really great feature that I'm passionate about is monitoring your credit score. You have complete access to your credit reports and history, and then Rocket Money will let you know if there's any important changes to your score or recommendations on things that you could be doing to improve it. I really feel like this is such a game changer, you guys. When I became really obsessed with my credit scores and saw all the ways that I could tweak and adjust, it changed it dramatically. I got this like new confidence about my credit score, which I know sounds so silly, but I used to be somebody who would like get anxiety if I heard like that there was going to be a credit check. And now I'm somebody who went from like never wanting to see it to checking in uh, multiple times a week, actually. Rocket Money can also help lower your reoccurring bills. All you have to do is upload a photo, tap a button, and then Rocket Money negotiates your bills for you. This can be anything from your internet service, your cable, to your phone bills. I think it's so cool. And I also think that I know that I'm getting older because I, I geek out with all of this like financial and, and savings talk. If you're like me, you can try it out for free and unlock even more features with premium. Head to rocketmoney.com slash Sherilyn or click the link in the description. You can also scan the QR code on the screen to get started. Thank you again so much Rocket Money for sponsoring today's video. All right, let's get settled, uh, grab your drinks, grab your snacks, grab whatever you need. Maybe a notepad, because there's lots to keep up with here. And while you do that, here's this week's riddle. What has many keys but can't open a single lock? All right, the documentary that I watched, it was called Into the Deep, The Submarine Murder. And it was filmed by a director, producer, Emma Sullivan. And she had reached out to this inventor named Peter Madsen to document his journey in wanting to build this homemade rocket ship and launch it to space. I believe she is from Australia, but she flew out and went and worked with him for months. I believe it was like over a year in Copenhagen, Denmark. Peter was generating a lot of buzz with his inventions and his ideas. He had also made a, a homemade submarine and people were wanting to talk to him. He had a lot of uh, interns and volunteers that were backing him and working for free and really believed in his vision. So this was a, a big story for people. And journalist Kim Wall was also interested in talking to Peter. 
There was also some drama going on behind the scenes with Peter and another inventor, and she kind of wanted to get a look into that. She had actually uh, recently spoken with that other inventor, gotten his side of the story, so she reached out to Peter to see if she could get his. Now, I didn't learn a lot about Kim in the documentary, and you, you know, if you've been here for a really long time, you know that I love to know about who the victim is that we are talking about and what their life is because it's so much more than just the snippet of a story and I was so thankful I came across a book that was translated to English and it was actually written by Kim's parents and gave me a much better insight into her life and just how astounding she she really was. Kim Wall was born on March 23rd, 1987. And her parents said right from the get-go, she was just someone who was so easy to love. She was a very curious, a very happy child. She was social and alert and just always wanted to know the reason why behind everything. From the get-go, she was a jet setter at a very young age, just traveling all around the world with her parents. And then a year after her birth, her brother was born and they went everywhere. They stayed in tents. They stayed in hostels, hotels, you name it. And the kids, they just couldn't get enough. And her parents believed like, just because you have kids doesn't mean you have to stop all of that stuff. They loved traveling and they wanted to instill those values and that curiosity into their children. And so they brought the kids along with every adventure that they took. I read that at school, kids just flocked to Kim for her imagination and her creativity. Also because she had a very sweet way of sticking up for the underdog or whatever she believed uh, was right. In elementary, her and one of her good friends actually wrote petitions and had their classmates sign the petition and post save this tree posters on this tree that she heard was going to be cut down in the kindergarten um, play area of the school grounds. And to this day, that tree still stands. Her friends describe her as having an un ending curiosity. Kim was an artist and a storyteller in every sense. She seemed to be utterly and uniquely unafraid of going into uncharted territories. She had wanderlust in droves and it hung off her every word. Kim had an infectious curiosity that was almost childlike in nature, full of innocence and goodwill. She grabbed every opportunity she could. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Along the way, her life became an adventure. She loved puns. She also had an impressive knitwear collection. They said she also gave the best hugs and often dragged them out for karaoke or dumplings. Both sound amazing to be dragged out to in my books. Kim was really driven. She was the first in her family to graduate with a degree in university. After school, she worked for the Swedish uh, Foreign Ministry, also for the European Union in India. And then she pivoted into journalism. She got her master's in journalism at Columbia University. And this was kind of something that was almost destined to happen, but something that her parents didn't want her to do. Her parents were both journalists and didn't want that go, go, go lifestyle for their children, but they just naturally got the bug. They spent so much time with their parents on location, taking them to go and write reports. They spent endless hours in, in newsrooms. So it was just kind of one of those things that was destined to happen. And Kim was becoming a very well-established journalist. She was traveling the world. She was writing about things like social issues, foreign policy, pop culture, equality issues, and her articles were being published in places like the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, The Guardian, the BBC, Vice. 
I think something that made her really stand out in in her profession is just like the broad range of interest that she had. In her Twitter bio, she describes herself as a journalist who writes about hackers, hustlers, voodoo, vampires, Chinatowns, atomic bombs, and feminism. And her storytelling took her all over the world. She spent a lot of time in India, Australia, New York, China. And she's described as the type of person who would really immerse herself into the culture not just seeing a story, going out quickly, writing about it, going up to stay in some swanky hotel and then moving on. She wanted to learn everything from the locals, where to eat, where to sleep, where to shop, how they lived, how their lifestyle could be bettered, how she could help. Often her family said that they would come out to some of these locations and and visit her. And Kim always had this jam-packed itinerary full of things that they got to do. And they were always so excited because they knew that it was going to be something that specifically curated by Kim from the locals that is something that you wouldn't just see on an everyday tour or read about in like a, a suggestion forum. This was her already being on the ground, submerged in this and giving her family an experience that they wouldn't normally have. So her work and her travels ultimately led her to Copenhagen, Denmark. And this is where she heard about Peter Madsen and then started to learn about some of this ongoing beef that he was having with another inventor. And when her friends heard about this, they were like, of course, it's Kim profiling some crazy inventor who's built his own submarine wants to launch him, launch himself into space. Like these were the type of quirky stories that she went for. One of her friends was quoted as saying she could take on any story. She had this ability to see interest in something that maybe not everybody did. And they quote unquote, Kim was a badass at whatever she did. Hi, my name is Kim Wall. I'm in the Middle Pacific. I'm the lady in the Marshall government's supply ship on my way back from the West of Castle. We're a bit reporting on the nuclear waste site uh, threatened by climate change. Uh, this is exactly the kind of story I like to do, where we combine on the ground shoe leather reporting with foreign policy that hopefully karma space for itself in the male dominant world of foreign policy. Thank you. Kim had this special ability to write a story that could leave the reader spellbound. I see water, I see sand, I see vegetation. All of this will be destroyed by climate change. 30 years old, Kim was on her way to establishing herself at the top tier of journalism. At the time that Kim reached out to Peter, she was in the middle of embarking on a new level in her career. Her name was circulating, becoming very well known and respected. And she is described as having this new light to her around this time. She could feel the shift and the climb that her career was taking off and all of the hard work that she was putting in was finally being recognized. And on Thursday, uh, August 10th, 2017, Kim and her boyfriend Ole were preparing to host a going away party for them and their friends because the two of them were set to move to Beijing in six days. This was something that was years in the making for Kim. It is somewhere that she always wanted to return to. China had this very special place in her heart and her goal was to go and and move to Beijing. So before the party, Kim reaches out to Peter. She had already reached out to him before and I believe he had shown some interest, but there hadn't been like a, a set date or time lockdown. So that was just something she did. She just wanted to be like, hey, you know, I'm leaving in six days. I'm going to reach out to this guy, see if I can wrap this story up because I believe it was going to be picked up by Wired magazine. She emails Peter and gets a response back. And he says, actually, I have time this evening if you want to come out and you can actually do the interview on my homemade submarine. Kim being so passionate about her work and so focused and driven was like, okay, well, I'm going to cut this party short and I'm going to go get my story. Kim also obviously saw something of a big potential in this story to go as far as to cut her night 
short to do this. And like I said at the beginning, he was catching a lot of interest from other journalists and even Emma Sullivan, who had reached out and was filming with him for several months to put together a documentary. This documentary is now out. Obviously, it has taken a much different turn than Emma intended, where it was started to just document his journey to self-launching himself into space. But she has hours and hours and hours of Peter and his staff working on the ship, talking about the submarine, touring the submarine. And the impression that I got from Peter in the documentary is that he's definitely very, I would say, eccentric, odd, quite intense, and pretty morbid with his one-liners. You're gonna die anyway. It's only a matter of how much pain. Your life will end in downfall, no matter what you do. Yeah. I read that he was the youngest of four brothers in his family, and when his parents divorced, he decided to go and live with his father, who was fascinated with space and space exploration. So that fascination, you know, spilled over into Peter at a very young age. I guess when he was only 15 years old, he launched his first rocket in his backyard. And as he got older, um, his interests expanded a little bit and he became also equally as interested in submarines and started constructing his own submarines as well. Apparently his goal was to be an engineer, but he never graduated. He did turn to welding though. I have a lot of respect for the welders. My, my dad is a welder. Everyone knows that my dad's always lurking in the comments and watching the videos. So a fun fact about him, he is a welder. So I guess Peter was also a, a relatively good welder and this allowed him to take his homemade ideas and then just bring them to the next level. Through this, he ends up teaming up with a lot of people who shared the same interests and goals as him and they create a group called Copenhagen Suborbitals, and their goal is to launch the first homemade rocket ship to space. I think things looked really promising to people and why there was so much hype uh, generated. I mean, they had a full crew of people who were working for free, interning, volunteering. They even had a lot of investors backing them financially to see this carry out. Unfortunately, though, there was a falling out between Peter and his partner. I guess there was lots of drama. Allegedly, the partner wanted Peter to build the rocket but not be a part of the launch. And I think Peter wanted to be a part of both. Like he definitely wanted to, to be the guy who also launched. So he felt like he was being used. He left. But he ended up staying very close because he ended up opening up a shop just 80 meters away in this abandoned shipyard that his now competitor, also had a shop in. So this whole drama is what Kim also wanted to write about. The plan was that Kim was going to meet Peter at the shipyard and they were going to go out on his homemade submarine that he named the Nautilus at 7 p.m. for around two hours. Kim goes out, she's even captured standing in the submarine as it's floating away. And then she texts her boyfriend and she says, I'm still alive, by the way. Another text says, but we're going down now. And the last text says, I love you with two exclamation marks. That was the last text that Kim sent anybody and the submarine never returned to the harbor. Her boyfriend was worried, but was trying not to get too worried, just thinking, okay, maybe something happened on the submarine. She's lost service, so she can't communicate with me. But by the time 1.45 in the morning rolls around, he's panicked and he calls the police station to report her missing. This was something that was taken very seriously. Immediately the Coast Guard went out. There was a notification across all of the nearby vessels and boats to keep an eye out for the submarine and for Kim and Peter. In the book that I read written by Kim's parents, they wrote about getting the phone call at 5.30 in the morning from Oli to say that she was missing, that he rode his bike all around the area and couldn't find her anywhere. Her parents also try to reassure him by just repeating kind of the same things that he had going on in his head, like maybe they're having some difficulty resurf resurfacing and she can't get through on her phone. She's going to come back and she's going to have a story to tell. In the meantime, they're all trying to figure out, okay, well, if that's the case, how long is the oxygen levels going to last? 
her boyfriend finds out that it can last for up to 24 hours. And so then they're thinking, all right, is is that does that mean that's 12 hours because there's two people in there? And if that was the case, they mapped it out that there was about only two hours left for Kim and Peter to be found. In the documentary, you don't get to see those sides. So again, that's why I was so appreciative to read this book and I highly encourage anybody who's interested in checking it out. It really gives a wonderful look into Kim's life and not just the story specifically. All of her accomplishments mixed in with kind of how her parents were carrying on in those early days and then how they have moved on by creating a legacy for Kim. In the documentary though, you do see um, footage of Peter's crew being interviewed and they're panicked because none of them even knew that he had a plan to go out that evening. So they don't even know where to tell the Coast Guard where to start to look. And you've got this mass body of water and this submarine, it's like a needle in a haystack. Early that morning though, Nautilus was sighted. It was sighted in a nearby bay around 10.30 but it was fully sunk, it floundered, if you will, by 11 a.m. All of this is kind of going on in real time in the documentary. Peter's crew is getting word that the Nautilus was found, then that it sunk, but then they hear that Peter and Kim were rescued by a passing boat. Kim's family also gets the same call. They are so ecstatic. They're hugging each other and just like trying to process, okay, now, now we have a story to tell and we can't wait to hear what Kim has to say. This past two hours has been a whirlwind. As those calls continue to come through though, we come to find out that Kim was not rescued and only Peter was. When he's rescued, there were actually reporters on the scene and they're asking him, hey, are you okay? And he just gives the thumbs up. He's like, yeah, I'm good, but I'm a little sad about the submarine sinking. No mention of Kim. So obviously Peter is taken in for questioning to try to figure out what happened. And he says that he was the only one on board the submarine at the time because he had already dropped off Kim on land. The story just doesn't sit right though. The police have this gut feeling that he purposely sank the submarine and they want to know why. And it's even more suspicious because now Kim isn't with him. And when they do an exam of his body, they see these fresh scratch marks on his forearms. And he also has some dried up blood on the side of his left nostril. Right then and there that day, he is charged with negligent manslaughter. At this point, he now changes his story and he admits that Kim is no longer alive, but it was all an accident. He says that as they were getting into the submarine, the heavy latch that closes it accidentally hit her on the head and it weighs about 150 pounds and it killed her when it slipped his grip. He says he immediately went into shock and then at some point had a nap. And then when he woke up, he decided that he was just going to bury her at sea. When police receive this information, they hold off uh, sharing it with the public. They decide to only tell Kim's family and their hope is that because there's so much interest and so many volunteers out there looking for Kim, that interest will still be generated. They're not, you know, instead of just being like, oh, she's no longer here, she's buried at sea, then people kind of think that that's more of a daunting task to find somebody. So they just hold on to the information and allow the search to continue for Kim. The following day, the submarine is found. It's brought up from the water. Unfortunately though, there is no sign of Kim dead or alive on it. But you could see that two of the valves on the sub were open, indicating that the suspicion that the police had that it was sunk deliberately was the case. Her family said one of the hardest things to accept in all of this was, if it was an accident, why didn't you call for help? Why would you just take it upon yourself to bury our daughter, our sister, our friend at sea? Like it doesn't make sense. They soon got that answer nine days later when a cyclist discovered a torso that had washed up on a beach. With all the publicity in the case and the fact that at the time Kim was the only reported missing woman, everyone's suspicions were that it belonged to Kim. During this time, Peter's belongings are all being searched, his hard drives have been confiscated, and those hard drives further supported the police suspicions 
that nothing was adding up and there was a lot to Peter that nobody knew. On his hard drive, investigators found videos that were saved of women being unalived, being decapitated and strangled. A lot of sadistic stuff that nobody had an inkling of. As much as Kim's parents didn't want to find out that the, these remains belonged to Kim, they're also in this limbo of agony of not knowing where she is or what happened to her. So they provide Kim's toothbrush, a hairbrush to see if they can match the DNA and they soon find out it does match and this is Kim. What happened to Kim? So inhumane, honestly, like worse than any nightmare that you could come up with in your brain. Her autopsy showed multiple injuries, mostly in the lower region. And there was metal pipes that were attached to the body, which is believed to be an attempt to make sure that it didn't float back up to the surface. There were no arms or legs or head remaining. And her family had to go through two months of this limbo of knowing of not knowing how to fully mourn her without not, not having their child. On October 6th though, there were cadaver dogs that went out to assist police and there was also police divers who recovered two plastic bags near the bay that the submarine was found. In the bags, they found Kim's head, her legs, her clothes, a knife, and then several days later, a saw was found in the water. It was a month after this discovery that the rest of Kim was found. I mean, this is horrendous enough to try to even just understand. But then when you see the documentary, there was footage being recorded just hours before he goes out. And during one of the clips, you can see this orange saw behind Peter in the background. And the next day when the film crew had gone back to interview the interns to try to figure out, you know, what's happened to Peter, what's going on when he's at this point missing. You can no longer see that orange saw there. And this is the one that was recovered from the water. Finally, once Kim was recovered, the medical examiner was able to see that there was no sign of blunt force trauma to her head, which did not align with Peter's story of this 150 pound hatch falling on her. So he's confronted and again, he changes his story. This time he admits that he was the one who did this to Kim, but that it was intentional. He said something happened to Kim on board and he believed that she had passed after carbon monoxide had entered the submarine. He said he was on deck at the time and then he came down and found Kim in that condition and took it upon himself to do what he did to Kim instead of calling for help. For the record, there was a toxicology report, an autopsy report done, and nothing showed that she had died from carbon monoxide poisoning. On January 16th, 2018, Peter was officially charged with murder, indecent handling of a corpse, and SA. His trial began on March 8th, and definitely the message that was being conveyed was that this was absolutely planned and this was part of a, a sadistic fantasy. The prosecutor said that when Kim was found there was no traces of Peter's DNA found on her but there were traces of his own fluids found on his underpants that he was wearing at the time of his arrest indicating that this was definitely a, an SA driven murder. Also, the blood that was on his left nostril when he was rescued turned out to be Kim's. I truly can't even imagine how horrifying those final moments were for Kim. This is a woman who was prepared to be in dangerous situations. You know, she traveled the world and was in quote unquote very dangerous areas of our world reporting on stories. She took hostage training situation courses for her job. And I, I, I would assume that the last place that she would have ever thought that she needed to be prepared was on a submarine doing an interview about homemade rocket ships. During the trial, one of his interns and a close friend of his shared a text that the two of them had had a few days prior to Kim going for a ride on the Nautilus with him. And at the time it was a text that she didn't really think much of, but it's something that 
may give a little bit of insight about how terrifying those final moments actually were for Kim. His intern had sent a text, something along the lines of, can you just send me a death threat or something like that so I can get this work done faster? She had a deadline to reach and she was feeling like she was just lacking motivation and just needed Peter to light a fire. So he replies, ha ha ha, you must be bound in Nautilus. I will bind you and pierce you with a skewer. Then the pocket knife comes out. I'm looking at your throat. Where is the pulse? I have a murder plan ready, which is a great pleasure. I mean, like I said, the guy is effing out there. He threw a lot of off-base, morbid comments throughout a lot of the footage that was captured for this documentary. But everybody just kind of like looked at it like, oh, that's Peter joking around and no one thought twice about it. It's until what happens to Kim comes out and then she remembers it. And based on this realization um, coming to during the documentary, there's no doubt in my mind that she was actually the intended victim, not Kim, sorry, the intern. I'm not gonna use her name because in the documentary, I believe that it's even a false name and her identity is concealed just because of how devastating all of this is. But she's looking at the dates on her phone and the morning of Kim not coming back from the submarine, he had actually reached out to this intern and invited her on the submarine that evening. And she was excited. She was like, yeah, that sounds great. So that was the plan. And then when Kim reached out to see what day and time he had available before she left in six days, he canceled with the other girl and took Kim out instead. And I mean, this, not only if you already have that to just prove that it was a plan, hours before he had gone out with Kim, his Google search showed him looking up keywords like female, female beheading, pain, agony. Really the only thing that the defense had was that Peter was trying to say that multiple people were in his workspace and that it was his interns that were searching these things. Which I mean doesn't really make sense just due to the fact that his intern was not somebody who was last seen with Kim, it was him aboard. And then multiple um, of his volunteers had testified. They had all kind of said that he had odd behaviors, but that everyone just brushed it aside because, I mean, some people are just like eccentric and they're just a little bit odd and they say off base shit and it doesn't mean that they're murderers and uh, fair enough. But when it came out what happened to Kim, one of them had testified that Peter had asked him if he knew about these sites that were out there where you could see these types of things happening to women. Like they were videoed and you could watch them and asked if he wanted to to watch and he was like, no, I don't. You guys, the, I, the guy is effing twisted. Really is the only exclamation I can think of. Disgusting also. On April 25th, he was convicted of all three charges and he was sentenced to life in prison, which is I think a far too nice sentence. Since he's been in prison, he has already tried to escape though. This was happened on October 20th, 2020. I guess he had threatened a prison psychologist. He had this like pistol object, something that looked like a pistol, caught this person off guard. He was able to kind of run away. And then as the guards were trying to catch him, he said that he had a, a bomb belt on him and that he was gonna detonate it. So he gets a little bit away, bomb squad comes, and he was found like 500 meters away and then brought back to prison where he remains and where I hope he rots for the rest of eternity. <laughs> After Kim's death, her family founded the Kim Wall Memorial Fund and their focus is to be able to give funding to female reporters who shared the same vision as Kim. There's also been memorial runs that have taken place in Kim's honor. And in October 2017, she was nominated for Pre-Europa's Outstanding Journalist of the Year Award. Kim's family and friends have mentioned numerous times that they want her remembered for a very, very long time as a qualified journalist and just a wonderful woman all around and not a victim of this crime. And a memorial fund is just a wonderful way to do that, recognize her and then recognize up and coming female reporters who can carry on Kim's legacy. 
So I'm going to leave a link for that in the description below. I'm also going to leave a link to the Kim Wall Memorial Facebook page where if you want to just like send some encouraging words and love, you can also do that. All right, you guys, that is it for me today. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. It means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. The answer to today's riddle, what has many keys but can't open a single lock? And the answer is a piano. I wish I could play the piano. All right, I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon. Bye.